Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritis. Thanks for joining me today, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Let's get into some of the economic news today. So starting with the U.S. markets, we had the S&P 500 up four points. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up eight. The NASDAQ was up 14 points. The Russell 2000, the small cap index, closed up five points for the day. Now, I didn't watch the markets very closely today. I was out and about. But I do believe the Dow was up around 60 or 70 points at its highest point today, and then sort of towards the end of the day during that last trading hour, it sold off rather rapidly, and it closed up eight points. Typically, we've been seeing the opposite. We've been seeing maybe a steady day, and then during that last hour of trading, we see a big run-up, and maybe it closes up 50 points or 100 points, where it rallies from being even down for the day to closing up. Is this the end of the rally? Are we running out of steam? We've had a huge January. We've had a big February thus far. We're halfway through the month. Is it running out of steam? Are we hitting those technical levels? Is the market sort of getting a little skittish? Is it time to pull back or is it time to march on? Because we had a tweet from Donald Trump today that said the stock market is going up up, up. He said, had the opposition party, meaning obviously the Democrats, and Hillary Clinton, had she had become the president of the United States, that the stock market would be down 10,000 points. Obviously, he's referring to the Dow, which would put it at about 15,000, 16,000, which would have been devastating. If that happens now, even with Donald Trump there, I wouldn't be surprised. Most definitely wouldn't have been surprised if it was Hillary Clinton. Won't be surprised if it happens under Donald Trump. He can get out there and tout where he's bringing his billions and billions in tariffs from China. Of course, again, it's not China that's paying it. It's you, the consumer. Or the business who imports those goods and maybe you're holding off on passing those costs along. Maybe. It's, it's not the economic miracle that he continues to tout and pat himself on the back for. Now, is it going to be a 10,000-point sell-off anytime soon? It's anybody's guess. All I know is when the man said, buy the dip, it rallied 1,000 points back in late December, early January. He said the stock market's going to continue to make new highs. Well, it could. If this thing continues to rally, it most definitely could make new highs here in the next month or two. Most definitely possible. Or are we hitting technical levels and everybody in the market is in a group think? Well, we're getting close to that 2800 number on the S&P. We're close to the 200-day moving average. We're really bouncing around it. That's some resistance. It had some difficulty doing it in the past a few times. Can it blow through it? Sure it can. That's a possibility. Anything in this market today is a possibility because it's all fixed. It's all rigged. It's all distorted. We are in the land of Oz. Because time after time, we get bad news. From the consumer, we get some bad earnings reports from some big corporations. It doesn't matter. Just buy, just keep buying, buy, buy, buy. And remember, a lot of this rally has been bid up on low volume. And again, that's important to note because low volume indicates that there's not a lot of conviction behind these people in the market buying. So the question becomes, who the hell is bidding this market up? I mean, I know, at least according to Donald Trump, he's got a lot of money. Does he have that much money to bid up the market? To the degree in which it has increased since Christmas? I don't think the president's that rich. But we do know he sent his secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, to the plunge protection team, to the largest banks in the U.S. after we hit bear market territory. And whatever he said to them, 
we've since had a rally in the stock market that apparently has no end in sight. Now, what was sort of interesting today, there wasn't a lot of hoopla and a whole lot of tweeting or texting or anything else today in regards to U.S.-China trade talks. Hallelujah, it's about time, right? But don't worry, the Chinese are here, they're in the States, they're in Washington, they're going to continue talks tomorrow and Thursday, and if they're good, maybe they'll stay the weekend. I mean, Trump Tower or Trump Hotel is right next door to the White House. Everything's good, you're, ha you're having a time of your life, show them around. Show them around, the government's open now, take them to the Smithsonian. They're all right there, show them some dinosaurs, some aerospace stuff, it's a good time. Maybe that'll convince them to strike a deal. Because just wait for it, you'll hear great news the rest of this week, and then we'll see how much this stock market can rally further. Now we had oil make a good move. It's up to uh, $56 a barrel. This is becoming an interesting story. Because the U.S. is supposedly awash in this stuff. Yet prices keep going up. Now, of course, that's in relation to the OPEC cuts. That's in relation to some of the cuts that Russia is involved with. So now you've got the supply and demand dynamics changing here. And you also have the shenanigans going on down in Venezuela. Now, if the U.S. takes up my policy, which I discussed yesterday, and we install Senator Marco Rubio as our Presidente of Venezuela, well, we can turn on the spigots, man. We can get the faucets going. We can up and increase supply of hell. We can get, we can get oil down to uh, 30 bucks a barrel. Maybe cheaper. I'm telling you, that's the plan of the century. Install Senator Marco Rubio as El Presidente of Venezuela. Take control of those assets. Because those are the big kahuna of reserves. Oil, natural gas in Venezuela, believe me. And it's in our hemisphere. Just travel south, you're right there. Keep the Chinese out. Keep Putin and the Russians out. Put the American flag, stamp it. Claim it. And I told you. All the proceeds that we sell it, if we sell it to other countries, you take all that money and it starts to fund the Green Deal. It's a win-win for everybody. I don't think that's going to happen, though. So we have an interesting story. If we have oil continue to rise, you're likely to see gas prices continue to rise. Uh-oh. Weren't low oil prices a boon for the consumer? Didn't that mean that the consumer can go out and spend more money that they don't have on stuff that they don't need, that they can't afford, that they're not going to use? So U.S. GDP can look better than what it is? We can't have that nonsense here in this country, can we, ladies and gentlemen? We have to continue to be patriotic Americans and buy, buy, buy. Get the plastic out. Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Whatever you got, use it. Whatever you want, buy it. Can't afford it, doesn't matter. Never going to use it, who cares? You're scratching your head, you're starting to wonder why you have problems. You're starting to wonder why the country has problems. Take care of yourself. Be smart and prudent with your money. Makes a big difference. Believe me when I tell you. So, it, 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 but in all honesty, we have oil prices going up. Will this continue for how long? I don't know. But if it does continue, or if it stays here, then that quote-unquote tax cut at the pump no longer exists. So what's going to happen to consumption? 
because we're always told lower gas prices leads to higher spending on the consumer in other parts of the economy. We're also told that when oil goes up, inflation starts to come into question. Uh-oh. What's the Federal Reserve going to do? Is inflation going to rear its ugly little head? Is it going to come out of the gopher hole? Is it going to see its shadow? Six more weeks of winter? What's going to happen? It's all becoming very interesting, isn't it? Is it going to box the Federal Reserve in? I don't think so, because they're in patient wait-and-see mode. What's one number? What happens if there's a surprise inflation? Number? Eh, who cares? Wait and see. Wait and see next month. See what happens. Gold and silver. Quite the move today. Quite the move today in the precious metal sector. Gold was up over 20 bucks. Silver's hovering around $16 an ounce. What's going on here? What is going on? We have the 10-year yield on the U.S. Treasury down to 265, 2.65%. So we've had a little bid on the Treasuries pushing these yields down. So there was demand for U.S. debt, which is obviously a dollar-denominated instrument, which should bid up the price of the dollar, but we had gold going up. We had oil going up, which are traded in dollars, which usually goes up when the dollar is weaker, but everything is moving in the same direction. However, when you look at the dollar's movement against the euro, it was down. Against the pound, it was down. But against the yen, the dollar was up. Here comes this decoupling. Here comes a whole bunch of nonsense. Now, of course, there's a whole bunch of other factors at play than just the strength or the weakness of the dollar or the demand and supply of these other commodities and currencies. Then we know for a while that there has been a dollar rally, so maybe that's reaching its limits as well. And there's a little bit of pullback. And we know that the Bank of Japan is concerned with the strength, the recent strength of the yen. Because the yen is seen as a safe haven asset. They don't like that. They want their currency to be as weak as possible. Because they're a major exporting nation. They run a huge account surplus. I mean, they are the exporters of the world. They really are. And like I told you yesterday, the Bank of Japan is never, never afraid to put the pedal to the metal when it comes to money printing. It's their art. Samurai swords, Toyotas, and money printing. The Chinese, I'm sorry, the Japanese do it very well. Very well. And that has ramifications. They've been doing this for 20, 30 years. I mean, they were an island unto themselves in this experiment, but they're a zombie economy, and they have terrible, terrible demographics. So they got a double whammy. They have all this money printing and stimulus that's never really stimulated the economy because it's a zombie economy. And you have a whole bunch of old people that are not being replaced by young people and they're not being replaced by immigration. So they have a demographic cliff that is going to decimate that country. It's just a matter of time. Unless you can really get the birth rate up, or you open the door and let a whole bunch of migrants come into the country, which is very unlikely. Very unlikely. Despite what everybody wants to say about the United States, we are very much a welcoming country. Look elsewhere around the world. If you're not Japanese, you're probably not getting in. If you're not German, you're probably not getting in. I mean, look at the Brexit. One of the main reasons for Brexit was because of the free movement of people. They don't want a whole bunch of people from other countries that they don't know. 
And it's anybody. It's not merit-based. It's just, come on in. They don't like it. Doesn't have much to do with being racist or any of that crap that you hear on the left. I mean, anybody who comes knocking on your front door, you're going to let them in? No. You want to know who they are. It's, it's just common sense. It's not an argument. There's nothing to think about. It's not your country. You want to come in here? We'll be welcoming, but it's got to be merit-based. You're going to contribute? Have you broken the law in your home country? What are your intentions here? A little bit of common sense goes a long way, believe me. Now, let's see. If we move on to our market risks of 2019 put together by Deutsche Bank. We left off yesterday on point 25, but 24, I'll get back to point 24 because point 24 and 25 are still related. Point 24 was Chinese economy less and less responsive to stimulus. So for a quick recap, this just goes back to our discussion on diminishing marginal returns. How much more can the Chinese do to stimulate the economy? And are they really going to get enough bang for the buck? How many more tax cuts can they do? How much more money printing can they do? We just had the discussion that last month in January saw the highest amount of loans ever. Ever. They need to stimulate their economy. Well, they don't have to. But they don't want this house of cards to come tumbling down. So in order to do that, they're going to print as much money, try to stimulate, try to double the amount of foreign direct investment into China to keep this thing propped up. Because they know it's weak. They know what the auto sales figures are. They know they continue to decline. They know the retail sector has continued to decline had that conversation yesterday. Eight straight months. Eight straight months of declining retail sales. And that's okay, folks. That This is the ebb and flow of an economy. It's just what happens. Some days you're happy. Some days you're sad. Some days you're in between. Some days you're depressed. And then you're happy again. It's just the ebb and flow of nature. It's the ebb and flow of a market. Just because you're going through a, a slow patch doesn't mean it's the end of the world. But when you keep kicking the can down the road and embark on these ludicrous policies, you really set up the stage for an event that could look like the end of the world. So just let this thing run its course. Sometimes you get sick. You sneeze, you cough, you're better in a few days. Just let it run its course. Point 25, China, current account deficit arrives faster than consensus expects. Now, we're always told that China is this great export behemoth. Well, they are starting to become very much a consumption-driven economy. And that's by design. Of course, it's all by design. They're a communistic nation. Everything's centralized. Everything comes from the top down. So a current account deficit just means they start, they're starting to import more than they export, which is true. How big of an effect this is going to have on their economy? It depends how much they continue to go down this, this road, how much do they continue to borrow. How overleveraged does the government continue to get? All of these SOEs, these state-owned enterprises... How many of them continue to default? How many of them are going to be bailed out by the government? How many corporations are going to be over leveraged? How about the consumer balance sheet? Eight straight months of declining retail sales. Maybe they're over leveraged. Maybe your housing market's out of control, which it is. Some of these things just need to deleverage. It's not going to be easy, it will be painful especially for a lot of people, but this is the ebb and flow of things. 
you cannot control everything, even if you are a communist. Point number 26. Japanese growth can get hit by China slowdown. Well, that's sort of a no, no-brainer, right? I mean, they're next-door neighbors. Obviously, China is a huge economy. Japan is a huge economy. There's a lot of trade going back and forth. If China slows down, Japan slows down. Even if Japan slows down, China's probably going to feel it. So that's a two-way street as far as I'm concerned, but it's a serious and legitimate concern, and it should be on this list. I agree with that. But that's pretty self-explanatory. Then we have point number 27, emerging markets. Potential political changes in India, Argentina, South Africa, and Indonesia. Well, I've spoken to you guys recently about India in regards to the Reserve Bank of India doing a 180 in policy, and they cut their interest rate. That was a surprise move, by the way. The markets were not expecting a cut. Now, it wasn't a huge cut, but it was an interest rate cut nevertheless, and it was done because, well, you guessed it and you know. It's a political year. It's an election year. And if something can be done from the central bank to stimulate the economy, well, you can help the politicians stay in office. And that's exactly what happened. So forget about the independence that is supposed to exist between a central bank and its government. Let's just be open and honest about it. You got a politician, he wants re-election. Put in your guy of choice. Cut the rates. Let's stimulate the economy. Hopefully, as a result, I get reelected. It's not rocket science. Just be honest about it. Just be honest about it. Just have Ben Bernanke of the U.S. come out and say that. Have Janet Yellen come out and say that. Have Jay Powell come out and say that. Have Mario Draghi of the ECB come out and say that. Just put all your cards on the table. What, what's everybody hiding? This is becoming the open secret. There is no independence. There's very little credibility. So just print as much money as you want. Cut rates as low as you want. Go negative. Go to negative rates, and in in some places you have. And just start throwing money from the sky. Just give us all a million dollars and see what happens. I'll tell you what will happen. Milk will be 50 bucks a gallon. A loaf of bread will be 25 bucks, but you'll be a millionaire. Bernie Sanders will take care of you. Point number 28. Continued increase in global inequality. Well, I cued Bernie Sanders right on time for that one, huh? Global inequality, and this is serious. This, this does exist. Global inequality does exist. And I've told you why time and time again. Because we have central banks that print all of this funny money. It goes to the wealthy first. It goes to major corporations first. They line their pockets with it. They engage in financial engineering. Increases their stock prices. Their compensation is tied to the performance of their stock price. They make more money. Rinse and repeat. In addition, the wealthy own financial assets. Central banks are out there stimulating financial markets to increase the price of those financial assets. So, of course, the rich are going to get richer. That's the policy. That's the plan. Now, if you look at Ray Dalio, who is the manager of Bridgewater & Associates, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, hedge fund in the world, $160 billion under management, he and his team, I think, do a pretty good job, perhaps a really good job, of being market and financial historians. And Ray Dalio is an interesting guy to listen to. I recommend you finding him on YouTube. You can find him with Bloomberg, Fox Business, CNBC. He gives plenty of interviews now. And what he and his team are saying is this growth in global inequality hasn't been seen since the late 1930s. The late 1930s. What happened in that time? Well, in the U.S., it wasn't really good, was it? 
we're still suffering from the Great Depression. If you look at stock market uh, figures, there was a big sell-off in the late 30s. Not a good time. There was a rise of populism. And depending where you were, it was either a question of nationalism or maybe socialism or maybe fascism. And you had the rise of Adolf Hitler. You had the rise of Lenin and Stalin. You had the rise of Mussolini. And if you look at that today, we know that there's a huge populism movement, and we know that there's a big nationalist movement. You have Donald Trump as president. You have a nationalist movement in Italy. You have the Yellow Vests in France. The only difference this time that Ray Dalio and his team notes it's not just about populism. It's not just about global inequality. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's, that exists right now. But, he says, and very importantly, we have never seen it like this before with this amount of debt in the business cycle. We are late in this business cycle we are late in this credit cycle, and we have global inequality, which is leading to this rise in populism. Now, read between the lines. That does not set up for a good market or for a good economy. So strap in. What does he say to do? Well, he's not going to show his hand. You can't expect him to show us, and he's managing $160 billion. But his team is the king of diversification. That's what they're known for. So whatever they're doing, believe you me, they are getting prepared for something that the world has not seen in 80-plus years. And when you go back to that time frame, it was not good. So whether it's going to be some sort of massive sell-off or a decade or two of very depressed earnings in depressed markets. It's really anybody's guess. But those are sort of the two scenarios that I sort of read between the lines on. It's either going to be big and quick or it's going to be dragged out for decades. I don't know which one you would rather have. I really don't want either. But this is what we've done to ourselves, to ourselves, so you can't be surprised that this is the medicine that we have to take. But that's point 28. We'll end this tomorrow. Thanks for joining me, guys. Please like, share, subscribe. Leave your comments. I would love to hear from you. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Garitis. Godspeed.